Okay, so let, let's start and if some more join, we'll bring them up to date. So we're on this uh, line in the Mishnah that the king cannot judge nor be judged, which you see underlined here towards the bottom. So this line is a very odd line because that's so, so I, I want to argue or so I'm arguing. And the reason it's odd is because we're talking about a Jewish king and a Jewish king, um, again, this text is dated 2000 years ago, almost. So we're talking about 2000 years ago, what's the attitude about whether a Jewish king ideally, optimally should judge? Can he be a member of the court? Can he be the chief judge? Normally in the ancient world, the Caesar, the emperor, surely had a, a power over all aspects of the empire, including judging. So it's very shocking and striking to say that ideally, even if there is a, a polity that has a judiciary and has a king in it, that the Jewish king will not judge. That's very, um, in its time and place, a remarkable rule to disqualify or to preclude the king from judging okay and then it talks also about that the king cannot be judged that's less surprising because in the ancient world i think he, to say that there's a type of sovereign immunity it's not so surprising but in halakha in a in the in the uh, religious system, it is a bit surprising because under halacha you think everybody is, should be subject to the halacha. So, in other words, both parts of this mishnah are not obvious or even surprising or even remarkable or even revolutionary. Just to capture it even a little bit more, to say that the king cannot judge. So we saw just uh, and I'll just bring it here. You know, what about King Solomon? King Solomon was a king and he judged, right? King David was a king and he judged. The uh, Isaiah describes the Messiah who's going to be a king and he'll judge. So it's to say that the king doesn't judge is just a very, you know, remarkable statement to make. Um, and to say that the king is not judged, okay. You know, again, emperors weren't judged. That's true. But a Jewish king, you would think a Jewish king should answer to God's law. Right. So. This entire Mishnah is not obvious. Now, what I want to focus on today is the Babylonian Talmud. What does the Babylonian Talmud do with this Mishnah? And what you'll see is that the Babylonian Talmud actually does, we, we peaked at this last time, but let's just begin anew with this. The Babylonian Talmud um, does stuff that's, you know, uh, also, uh, that, uh, let me put it this way, the Babylonian Talmud seems to have a hard time with this Mishnah. What do you mean a king doesn't judge, but King David judged? But King Solomon judged, but the Messiah judged. That seems to be that was sort of the impulse of the of the Babylonian Talmud. So let's look at the Babylonian Talmud together now. I I have it more than once here, but I want to look at this. I just have a few PowerPoints which have the same thing on it, but I want to uh, um, I want to. Um, Sorry, just some other people. This is actually a good time. Let's allow people to join. That way we could, uh, I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. So, um, okay, again, so I'm just going to just repeat our starting point one more time. I'm going back to this Mishnah. And the Mishnah says the king cannot judge nor be judged so that means a jewish king in hebrew it's melech lo dan lo daninoto that's in hebrew in english it's the king cannot judge nor be judged 
So we're talking about a Jewish king. We're not talking about a pagan king. We're not talking about a Gentile king. We're talking about a Jewish king. You know, uh, it, this is not necessarily in a period where there was a Jewish king. This might be talking about in theory, if there is a Jewish king in the future, but maybe it is talking about when there was, and it could be in a period where there is one, or if there isn't one in theory, what is the constitution according to the halacha? And the answer here in the Mishnah is that a Jewish king shall not judge. And also a Jewish king cannot be judged. And we said again, and then for those who join now, again, I'll just repeat, to say that the Jewish king doesn't judge seems to be very hard to understand. How can you say a Jewish king cannot judge? For example, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself, but for example, King Solomon judges, right? So what do you mean a Jewish king doesn't judge? It seems to be one of the basic tasks of a Jewish king to judge. So here we have the... Um, I'm sorry, it's just a little tricky. Some people are joining, which is great. It's just, I want to, once we get going with the Babylonian Talmud, things are going to get more intricate. So I want to make sure we're all starting at the same time here, okay? So I apologize that I just have to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, in a minute, we're really going to get going with this Babylonian Talmud. Um, sorry, I'm also trying to see you guys more. I'm looking at my view, okay. Okay, so again, the Mishnah says the Jewish king does not judge. But we know that that seems to be not the practice in the ancient world. Uh, Caesar's judge, the emperor's judge. And in the Bible also, Solomon judged. So what do you mean the king doesn't judge? So it comes along the Babylonian Talmud and it does the following thing. And this is a very, very fascinating example of what the Babylonian Talmud can do with the Mishnah. Um, and, and I just got to make a comment that if you studied in a more traditional yeshiva at some point, this is not sort of the way it's described in the yeshiva. Because in the yeshiva, you read a Mishnah and you read the Talmud and whatever the Talmud says, that's what the Mishnah means. But, you know, sometimes, you know, I've learned a little bit uh, by hanging out maybe in university that uh, maybe we're missing sometimes a little bit an appreciation of, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, amazing sort of development of halakha when we don't pause and look at the Mishnah and then look at the Talmud and then look, is the Talmud uh, reading the Mishnah in a simple way, in a, a surprising way? So let's look at the Talmud. Is everybody, let's look together. So here's the Talmud. The Talmud says the following. But why, um, sorry, let's go back here. Says the Talmud, this refers only to kings of Israel. Kings of the house of David, however, both judge and are subject to judgment. For it is written, O house of David, thus says the Lord, render just verdicts morning by morning, etc. So what does the Talmud say? The Talmud comes along, the Babylonian Talmud. And it says, when the Mishnah says a king doesn't judge, that only refers to kings of Israel. But kings of David judge. What does that mean, Israel versus David? Israel just means non Davidic. Right? Israel means like King Saul, for example. King Saul was a king in Israel, but he wasn't from the house of David. So, what does the Talmud say? Whether a king can judge or not depends on whether the king, on the king's tribal affiliation. Kings from non-Davidic, Israel just means non-Davidic. Non-Davidic kings cannot judge. But Davidic kings can judge. So what were our examples? David judges, Solomon judges, the Messiah is going to judge. Says the Talmud, yeah, because they're all Davidic. Davidic kings judge. But Israelite kings, non-Davidic kings, they do not judge. Now, the Talmud at first doesn't explain what, what's the difference. But we could make a little of a guess. Does anybody want to guess? What's the ideal rule and what's sort of the uh, inferior rule? Davidic 
in general, which kings uh, do you think, in the eyes of uh, the halakha, which kings are superior, Davidic or non-Davidic? Alan, you want to take a guess? I can't hear you. You're on mute. Alan, are you on non-mute now? I'm off. Okay. Davidic. Yeah. Davidic. Davidic kings are ideal. Yeah. They're superior. Non-Davidic kings are inferior. That that's clearly true in Jewish tradition. Okay. Whether uh, you know again why? Because we assume in Jewish tradition that the ultimate uh, dynasty belongs to the tribe of David, the tribe of Judah, and it belongs to a line, the line of David and his kids. So the ideal kings, according to the Babylonian Talmud, judge and are judged. And inferior kings do not judge and are not judged. Right? Does everybody see that? That's what's emerging from the Talmud. This refers only to kings of Israel. Kings of the house of David, however, both judge and are subject to judgment. Now, I argued last time that... That's very interesting that the Babylonian Talmud says that, but I don't think that that is the simple reading of the Mishnah. I don't see any hint in the Mishnah. That, let's go look back in the Mishnah. The Mishnah never said the king, look there at the bottom, the king neither judges nor be judged, be judged, etc. It never said Davidic kings, non-Davidic kings. It never introduced a dichotomy. So what the Babylonian Talmud is doing is the Babylonian Talmud is basically saying the entire Mishnah is referring to inferior kings. Yeah? Why would they even bother? Why would the Mishnah talk about inferior kings? That's a great question. I actually don't know the answer to that great question now. Because I, I have to say, I, I, you know, I sometimes, uh, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I'm being disrespectful to the Babylonian Talmud. I'm saying the Babylonian Talmud, I think, is offering an interpretation of the Mishnah that is a Babylonian Talmudic interpretation of the Mishnah, but I don't understand how that could be the original intent of the Mishnah. Okay? What do you consider inferior kings? Inferior kings are non-Davidic kings. They are inferior. Now, you're, you're asking a good question. What do you mean? Every non-Davidic king? There was never a good non-Davidic king? Is King Saul necessarily such an inferior king? Uh, by definition, every non, I don't know, some Hasmonians were, uh, at least in the eyes of the rabbis, good people. So everybody's inferior. But I would say, yes, normatively, they're inferior. Normatively, they're inferior. And because they're inferior, normatively, normally is a fancy word, but I'm just saying their status is they're treated in a, a lesser uh, way. And they're treated in a lesser way. We say you're not invited into the judiciary. Because your status, because you're more questionable, you're not invited into the judiciary. The only king who's invited into the judiciary is a king who's like David, who's like Solomon, a king who's wise, who's virtuous, who's righteous. Now, don't start asking me questions in the Bible. Is every story about David all a perfect story? And about Solomon, those are good questions, but don't ask that to the Mishnah. The Mishnah is the, ba the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud is making generalization. The generalization is we could trust Davidic kings. We cannot trust non-Davidic kings. That's a presumption. So therefore, I mean, I'm adding a little bit, but I think this must be behind the, the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud is saying the Mishnah that says a king should not judge. Let's ex ignore for a second the second part. Nor <coughs> being judge. Just saying that a king is distanced from the judiciary. That applies to... The kings who were suspicious about, inferior kings, non-Davidic kings, but the ideal kings, Davidic kings, the, the A-list of kings, they can be in the judiciary. The only thing I'm just saying, I want to go continue on with the Babylonian Talmud. I just want to say that that, oh, that that reading of the Mishnah, I think, is not a simple reading of the Mishnah. Because of a few reasons. One is what Alan just asked. Why would the Mishnah be talking about inferior kings? Why wouldn't they be talking about the, the ideal kings? It's just a little odd. Why would the Mishnah be talking about inferior kings? That's one question. The second question you could ask is, the Mishnah here contrasts kings with the priest. Now, the contrast actually is not a really good contrast if we're talking about only a subgroup of kings compared to a priest. So in other words, the whole symmetry falls apart. Then there's a third question you could ask. If you continue in the Mishnah, 
the Mishnah actually gives some examples in the continuation, and all the examples happen to be King David. For example, uh, here are three lines from the bottom where they talk about a king participating, uh, getting married. Uh, and, and they talk about David. Or in the next line, uh, king participating in the funeral. Look in the third line. They give the example of David. Did David participate in the funeral of Avner? So it's a little odd to say the Mishnah is referring to non-Davidic kings, and yet every time a king by name comes up in this chapter, it happens to be King David. So to me, again, I, 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 it's not like sort of a very traditional way I'm speaking, so I apologize. But, but still, I have to teach the way I understand. I understand that the Babylonian Talmud is interpreting the Mishnah not in its simple sense. It's rereading the Mishnah, as it were. Okay? It's rereading the Mishnah. Now, you could ask a good question. Why would the Babylonian Talmud reread a Mishnah? Why wouldn't it read the Mishnah in its simple sense? Why would it read it against its simple sense? And to me, part of the answer is because the Babylonian Talmud doesn't understand how the Mishnah coheres with things like King Solomon and King David and the Bible. To say a king doesn't judge just doesn't seem to align with our traditions in, in, in the Tanakh and in Jewish history. So in other words, that might be part of what drives the Babylonian Talmud. That might be part of what drives the Babylonian Talmud. Alan. Is there any, circum, any circumstances where the king was judged? David was judged? I mean, they, uh, with, with Bathsheba, the Bible, maybe? Are there any examples of a king being judged? What you have in the Bible is you have prophets like Bathsheba. You don't have him being judged, but you have a prophet who, uh, you know, gives musr, as they say. So you don't have a king being judged, but you basically have the king being told by God that you're uh, straying from the right path. And that happens all the time in the Bible. But that's yeah, not that being judged. That's being told through the prophet that your ways are sinful. So so why do they say he can't uh, that he cannot be judged he cannot be judged and it's also odd that um you know i can understand the part where he says he can't judge but why can't he be judged even even the ones um even the non-debatic lines but, why can't they why can't they be judged yeah you would think uh, let me rephrase alan's question i think it is the same thing alan's asking an interesting question he, he I, I alan tell me if this is similar to your question if non-davidic kings like kings from benjamin or from the priests or from any tribe other than david are seen as more suspicious you would think the more suspicious kings who you don't invite into the judiciary nevertheless should be judged. Why should they be exempt from being judged? Right. Yeah. Good question. So the Talmud's going to help us answer that question. Now, I want everybody who's with me who joined, etc. even if you joined a minute late, now it's fine. We're going to leave the Mishnah. I want us to follow the Talmud. And this is a very interesting Talmud, Babylonian Talmud that's going to explain more this idea that Davidic kings, who are ideal kings, can participate in the judiciary and also must answer before a judiciary, but non-Davidic kings, who are inferior kings, both are barred from the judiciary and also are not subject to be judged. That's a mouthful, but the Talmud's going to explain it with a story. And this is where everybody could join and follow the story. And I need your help interpreting this story. Here's the story. The Talmud's going to tell us a, a historical event. I put it in quotes because, you know, the Talmud tells us this history. And I, it's not that I'm totally uh, skeptical that the Talmud's history happened. But it could be the Talmud has a version of the history, a legendary version of the history, but okay, let, let's follow it. 
And here I just put in B1, B2, and you'll see I have B3, B4, B5, just for, to help us to read and analyze. Now, everybody, this is a good time to focus, even if you, you came in a little late. Now we're all on the same page. B1A, why the prohibition of non-Davidic kings judging or being judged? Like, wh where'd that come from? That these non-Davidic kings are treated differently than Davidic kings in terms of their eligibility to be judges and also in terms of their being subject to the jurisdiction of the court. And the Babylonian Talmud tells us the following tale. Because of an incident, does everybody see I'm on the top, B1 by where it has the B. Because of an incident which happened when a slave of King Janaeus killed a man. Okay, the Talmud's going to tell us a tale. A tale of a king who was associated with a crime. Okay, this just happens to be interesting because we live in an age of impeachments where there's a lot of energy being spent on trying to examine whether right now one ex-former president was involved in illegal activities, wasn't involved, etc. And without getting political, it just happens to be in the news all the time. Some people think it's a good thing. Some think they'll think it's a bad thing. But either way, it's in the news all the time. January 6th, the commission, did President Trump violate law? Did he not violate law? So you see, this is a very ancient tale. And the Talmud's giving us a version of such a tale. And the version of the tale is there was an incident where it's not the king who did a murder. Here, in this case, it was a murder. But it was the slave of the king who did a murder. But as we'll continue to read, the slave of the king, the Talmud's going to assume that the slave of the king's, uh, what he did, you know, relates back to the king. In some form, the king has some level of responsibility. So there was an incident when a slave of Janaeus killed a man. Does anybody know who King Janaeus was? He was, the full name of King Janaeus is Alexander Janaeus, or in Hebrew, Alexander Yanai. If you walk around uh, Israel, you will see his name sometimes. Because you'll find he was an ancient, actually, Hasmonean king from the Hashmonaim after the, the Hanukkah story. But he's a king who uh, is, at least in the Talmud, there are very ugly things about King Janaeus. He's not, this is one of the difficult things about the Hashmonaim, that the Hashmonaim, the first of the Hashmonaim, we usually think Matityahu and Judah Maccabee and all of them, you know, the assumption is that they were very righteous. But by you go a few generations into the Hasmonean kings, they became pretty corrupt, okay? And, and even tyrannical. And very ironically, they became very Hellenistic or Roman in their ruthless form of rule. And the Talmud is filled with story, not filled, but has several famous stories where uh, in the Talmud, um, the um, Janaeus, Alexander Yanai, persecutes the sages. Persecutes the sages. And he seems to have uh, switched from being a Prushi to a Tztuki, a Pharisee to a Sadducee. Okay, so we don't need to connect all these legends together, but it's very clear in this story, Alexander Janaeus is not a, uh, he, he's a bad guy. In the eyes of the rabbis, he's a bad guy. Now, in what sense is he a bad guy in this story? So far, he's just associated with a murder. That's not a good thing. Although it doesn't, again, it didn't say he did the murder. It says the slave did the murder. So an incident happened when a slave of King Janaeus killed a man. So the question is, what are the sages going to do about the fact that this tyrannical Hasmonean king this corrupt Hasmonean king is associated with a murder. Will they look the other way or will they respond? So Shimon ben Shetach says to the sages, be bold, let us judge him. 
Who's Shimon ben Shetach? You recognize that name. Shimon ben Shetach is the name of a sage, an ancient sage. He shows up in the beginning of Pirkei Avos. In the ethics of our fathers, the sayings of our fathers, one of the earliest sages mentioned in Pirkei Avos is Shimon ben Shetach. And we have several sources in rabbinic literature about Shimon ben Shetach. And Shimon ben Shetach seems to be a standout sage, one of the early standout sages. So is everybody with me? Just make sure, let's make sure we're following. The Talmud's about to get into the explanation about why kings who are non-Davidic are treated differently than Davidic kings in terms of whether they can judge or in terms of whether they can be judged. And the Talmud and it goes into a historical tale, a historical tale of an ancient king who was non-Davidic. He was, Hasmoneans are priests, right? So he was from the priestly tribes, but he's a, I'm adding, even though they don't tell you this, he's clearly a negative figure. He's a tyrannical king. He happens to be a descendant of the Hasmoneans and a Maccabee and a priest, but he's a, he's a uh, negative figure. And he had a slave who committed a murder. And now the question that the sages of that generation had to uh, uh, figure out is, should we pursue this king by making him answer to the law, to the halakha? So what's Shimon's attitude? Let us judge him. Okay? That's the end of B1. Everybody's with me? Any questions? Are we all on the same page? If not, something's unclear, ask now, because it's going to get a little more... Alan, I'm going to repeat for a minute to make sure you're with us. Okay? Um, the, the Talmud is explaining why the rule for non-Davidic kings about their whether they're judged or, are, uh, or can judge is different than for Davidic kings, and it tells us a tale. So we just began uh, analyzing the tale. The tale is that historically, once upon a time, there was a priestly king, a Hasmonean king, but a corrupt one, who was associated with a murder, his slave murdered, and the question is, should they look the other way, the sages, or should they have guts and force the king to answer for his association with murder, and Shimon ben Shetach, a very gutsy early sage, says, let us man up, let us do our duty, right? Be bold, let us judge this king. And that was, it's not a simple thing to try to judge a king, but let us do that. That's our duty, be too. Next phase. They sent for the king, saying, your slave killed a man. OK, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to be political, but just the Trump analogies here are helpful because they just make it very easy to relate to. Basically, they subpoena. They subpoena the king and they say, and show up in court. So what's King Janaeus's response? The king sent the slave to them. So the king says, OK. Go after the murderer. The murderer wasn't me. The murderer was the slave. So the king says, slave, you go answer to the sages. Now, the sages are not satisfied with that. Because I think it's very clear that the sages see the slave here as a pawn. Again, we don't know the exact uh, details of the murder and what happened and the whole intrigue. So we have to use our imagination. But I, I'm just saying. On some level, it's very clear that the sages assume that the really it all came from big boss, right? From the mafia boss, from the king. It didn't come from the slave who was the hit man. Okay, so, the, so he says, slave, okay, you go answer to the king. So they say, they sent to the king saying, you must appear with him. It's not enough to send... It's not enough to send the, uh, the uh, slave. You have to show up also. And they cite a verse for the Torah says, when somebody has an ox that gores, that the warning has to be given to the owner. You know, you can't just blame the ox. You blame the owner of the ox, teaching that the owner of the ox must come and stand by his ox. 
If an ox gored, then the owner is responsible. So too, the owner of a slave who has killed must appear in court. Again, I, I, the 21st century person in here doesn't love the comparison between an ox and a slave, but I'm not going to apologize for the Talmud. Either way, the point for the Talmud is it's not enough to tell the slave you're responsible. The master of the slave is responsible. And I'm adding a little bit with my imagination. In this case, maybe the slave is just like the hitman and the king's responsible. So they basically say, following Simeon, Shimon ben Shetach's gutsy move, they basically say, Janaeus, King Janaeus, you have to show up in court. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, we're in the middle of B2. King Janaeus, a slave, killed a man. The sages, based on the pep talk of the lead sage, Shimon ben Shetach, say, mm -hmm. King Janaeus, you have to answer. He tries to, you know, avoid. He tries to deflect. He tries to send his slave. They say, no, not good, not enough. You have to show up. Okay, next phase. I'm on the fifth line of B2. So he, meaning King Janaeus, appeared, but sat down before the court. Now this is a drama in the court. That's what's going on here. He shows up, but he sits down. And well, what's the idea of sitting down? The idea of sitting down is disrespecting the court. He shows up, but he basically says, I'm the king. By the way, think about it. In the ancient world, you know, the king sits on it. In modern world, too, a king sits on his throne. The king has a throne. So a king doesn't stand before people. The king sits down. So the king comes into court and he sits down because he's, I'm the king. So I'm not going to come in and follow uh, what the uh, court officer says to stand up. I'm going to sit down. So now Shimon looks at the king, three lines on the bottom, and he says, Then Shimon ben Shetach said to King Janaeus, Stand on your feet, King Janaeus. So witnesses may testify against you, for you do not stand before us, but before he who spoke and the world was created. So Shimon's a very gutsy sage. <clears throat> he looks at the king in the eyes, and he tells king, you have to show up, and now you're in court, and you have to follow the court orders, and you have to stand. And then Shimon adds a little of a theological explanation. He says, don't think that you're standing to show respect to the judiciary. <clears throat> you're standing to show respect to God. <clears throat> because sages and the judiciary who are applying the halakha are ultimately speaking on behalf of God's will. So in other words, King, you're too much involved in a political showdown and a drama and a political power play, but you have a skewed perspective because you're standing not before us, the judges. We're just proxies. We're just spokespeople. We're just interpreters of God's law. So stand before us because that's God's will. God's will is what? Not that God's will is that the sages should apply the halacha, and we're just uh, applying halacha, so stand before God. Again, this is very uh, loaded stuff, because you sort of imagine King Janaeus saying, who made you the spokespeople for God? But that doesn't, you know, intimidate Shimon. Shimon ben Shetach is confident he's a sage. He's a great Talmud Chacham. He's one of the great heroes in the beginning of Pirkei Avot. And he knows that uh, he's doing God's will. So if he's doing God's will, and God says that you're responsible to apply halacha, and halacha applies to everybody, and here you have a, a Jewish king who was corrupt, who was associated with a murder, so you have to call the king in front of the court, and you have to tell the king he doesn't get any special treatment. He must stand up. Because the sages are ultimately just applying the halakha of God. 
And King, you should understand that's what's going on. I'm not demanding personal respect, says Shimon. I'm demanding respect for the court, which is the God's court. Okay, by the way, any guesses before we turn the page how this is going to play out? I have one question, uh, completely yeah. different. I, I don't know much about King and I, but who appointed him the King and how did he become King? He's a, it's a good question, but basically overall there was a uh, inheritance. It was a dynasty because so the Maccabees, because what happened with Matityahu is just to review briefly the history, you know, the history is that during the second temple period, the uh, Judea was under Persian rule. After that was under Greek rule. Then you had the revolt of Matityahu and his sons, the Hasmoneans, and they succeeded in rededicating the temple and then establishing an independent Jewish state. And the rulers of that independent Jewish state were the uh, Matityahu's sons and uh, eventually their children. Okay. So uh, the okay. dynasty began. That's how he became king. Okay, thank you. There, there was some infighting like any Game of Thrones between the brothers and this and that, and over time it got ugly. But basically he inherited, yeah. After, after a uh, establishment of an independent Hasmonean state, he was in the line of inheritance and he inherited. So he says, I'm king and I'm king and I don't need an answer to a bunch of sages. And the sages say, well, we're the sages and we're to apply God's halakha and you do need an answer. Okay, any guess about how this is gonna play out, especially if you haven't seen the continuation? I got a question though. Mm -hmm. uh, this this guy's a non Davidic king. Yeah, but he's being um, uh, but he's being judged. Okay, because we're in the middle, Alan. Very good. Because we're in the middle. We're not done. <laughs> All right. That means you're following. You're saying, wait a second. Wasn't the whole point that we're trying to explain why non Davidic kings are not judged and do not judge? So far, it sounds like he is judged. So good. then, I, so sorry. So it, it's, there's going to be objection by the king, and the king says, "I can't be I can't judge, and I can't be judged. Uh, I'm sitting down." Okay, maybe that's your guess. Any other guesses? Okay, so let's keep reading. Okay, so next, I think, yeah, I think he gets away with it. Um, well, who's he? Janaeus? So, yes. He gets yes. away with resisting. Yes. Okay. Okay, good guesses, interesting guesses. Let's read what happens according to the Talmud. B3. The king replied, I will not act by your Simeon's word, but upon the words of your colleagues. This is a great moment. King Janaeus does show up in court, doesn't resist the sages totally. The sages, again, were given a pep talk by, I'm assuming, the lead sage, the most gutsy sage, maybe the most brilliant sage, Shimon ben Shetach. And Shimon ben Shetach says, let's be bold, let's judge the king. The king is evasive. He sends a slave. They say, not enough. You show up. He does show up. He shows up and he sits down. Shimon looks at him in the eyes and says, stand up. Have respect for this institution. We're a court of sages that are giving God's justice. So what does Janaeus, you know, the tyrannical, but the clever, the wily Janaeus do? He recognizes that there's only one sage who has guts and the rest of their sages are trembling in their boots. The rest of the sages are not with Simeon. They think Simeon has lost it. I'm adding, I'm embellishing. But they think Simeon is this heroic sage who's gone a little crazy. What is he doing? A stare down with a powerful, tyrannical king? So the king says, listen, Simeon, you're not alone. You're with a quorum of sages. So I'm not going to do what you do. Let me see what your colleagues say. Do your colleagues tell me that I have to stand up before the court? So he then turns to the left, turns to the right, all look at the ground. By the way, who's the he in that sentence? It doesn't matter so much, but I think the he is Simeon. 
I think that he is, you have to imagine like, a, you know, like the Supreme Court, let's just use the United States Supreme Court, where you have nine justices, and in the middle, you have Chief Justice Roberts. So Chief Ju the Chief Justice here is gutsy, but he looks to his right to his colleagues, and he looks to his left to his colleagues to see whether they're with him, expecting them to be with him, but none of them, they just avoid <laughs> because they're, they don't want to be there. They don't want to be in this showdown between this tyrannical, powerful king and this gutsy sage. They want to have nothing to do with this. So they're scared of the king, and I think they're also scared of Simeon. And they just avoid eye contact. They look at the floor. It's a great agada. It's a great, because it's very graphic. He turns to the left, he turns to the right, and they all look at the ground. And now we get to B4. And B4 is actually quite painful. Then Shimon ben Shetach, the great sage, says to his colleagues, are you wrapped in thought? Meaning you're making calculations now, trying to save your own necks, trying to avoid, shirk your responsibilities. Let the master of thoughts, God, come and call you to account. Instantly, Gabriel the angel came and smote them all to the earth and they died. Wow. I don't know if anybody, if you haven't seen this uh, passage, would have predicted that. That's a pretty dark turn. The dark turn is that Shimon almost curses his colleagues. He says, you are all coward, cravenly sages. And therefore, God ought to punish you. And indeed, on behalf of God, Gabriel, who's an angel, pierces into the courtroom. This is called like, in, uh, you know, uh, there's a, we could use a, there's a literary term for this, the deus ex machina. I, don't, I forget if that's how I pronounce it, but basically where deus God enters in. Deus ex machina, where God enters in. Sometimes in like the tragedies or theater or plays and, they, you know, where God suddenly pierces into the, into the theater, into the, the room, into the chamber. That's what happens here. God pierces into and enters into the courtroom. But not God directly, God's angel, Gabriel. And what does Gabriel do when he enters in? He just erases the sages, just eliminates the sages, wipes them out. That's B4. And then we get to B5. Then it was stated. I would uh, almost give a synonym for a state that then it was enacted. That a king may neither judge nor be judged, testify nor be testified against. Which is a quote from the Mishnah. In other words, B5 is saying against the backdrop of this basically terrible story, and then an enactment was made. The enactment that was made was, and now you have to add a little bit, but I'm going to add. Apparently, what was the enactment that was made? That a king should not be judged. Which king? Kings like Janaeus, right. which we could generalize to be non-Davidic kings. They should not be judged. And then apparently you have to add some steps. If they shouldn't be judged, then apparently they cannot judge either. Because apparently those go in tandem. Only somebody who, the only people, only kings who can judge are those who are subject to the jurisdiction of the court. But if you are not judged, meaning you're not subject to the jurisdiction of the court, then you cannot be a, serve as a judge either. That's what B5 says. Before, I want to analyze this more, but before analyzing, I want to just make sure everybody follows the basic story and what the story is doing in the Talmud. 
Okay, I'm going to just say it outside one more time. And if something's unclear, ask me because it's important that we all just follow the basics of what's going on here. The Mishnah said that a king is not judged and also doesn't judge. Let's leave the not judging right now because that might confuse us. Let's just focus on that a king isn't judged. That's what the Mishnah says. Comes along the Babylonian Talmud says, actually, Davidic kings are judged. Non-Davidic kings are not judged. Then the Talmud says, well, why? Why are non-Davidic kings not judged? And the Talmud says that actually all traces back to a historical incident, a pretty ugly historical incident. The historical incident involved a Hasmonean king, Alexander Janaeus, that I'm adding, we know from elsewhere, was a corrupt king, a tyrannical king. That king was associated with a murder, not directly, but through a slave. The slave killed somebody, and the sages of his generation had to decide, do they look the other way, or do they call the king to court? Simeon ben Shetach, Shimon ben Shetach, one of the great early sages, said, let's be bold, let's call the king to answer to God's halacha for the murder that he's associated with. At first, the king tries to deflect and send his slave. And Shimon says, not enough. You are responsible too. So King Janae shows up in court, but continues to be evasive and disrespectful and sort of thumb, uh, you know, the, you, know uh, uh, you know, just sort of uh, disrespect the court. So he comes and he sits down, sort of emphasizing, I'm king. I don't need to answer to you. I'm sitting on my throne right there in the middle of the court. Shimon says, king, stand up because you're not showing me respect and my colleagues respect. You're showing respect for God. And we sages are interpreting God's law. King Janaeus looks at Shimon and says, you're not a solo actor here. You have colleagues. Let's hear what your colleagues say. The colleagues are cowardly. They're not with Shimon. They're caught there. They don't want to be there, but they don't have the courage to judge a king. Shimon looks at his colleagues and is disgusted by their cravenly, cowardly ways, by their refusing to really probably fully believe in the fact that they're doing God's work. And by the way, I'm going to add, the Torah says, Lo tagumi pneish, have no fear in front of anybody. The Torah says that you should be, uh, you know, stand firm. So what are you afraid of this king? So Shimon more or less curses his colleagues and says, God should get even with you. And indeed, that's what happened. The Gabriel, the angel of God, comes in, pierces into the court, kills all the cowardly judges. And then the conclusion is, then they enacted that kings shouldn't be judged. And the Talmud seems to understand not all kings, but rather ruthless kings, tyrannical kings, chutzpah kings. Who are chutzpah kings, brazen kings? Not just Janaeus, but we have to be suspicious of any king who's non-Davidic. That's the, just the simple layout of the, what's going on in the Talmud. Any questions, just clarification. Yeah, but but it, that means that uh, Shimon was wrong. Ah, the other judges were uh, cowardly, but they were correct. Yeah, and the king, and the king was right. Yeah, I, Alan, I, I I I'm I'm totally with Alan. I think that is an extremely sharp comment that I'm very sympathetic to. Alan says. That there's something, again, I'm adding a little to his words, so I'm sorry to put words in your mouth, but I'm just going to use a little more colorful language. There's something outrageous about this tale. Because in the tale, it seems like Shimon is the heroic sage, the great sage, the gutsy sage, who speaks truth to power, let's use, right? Who's not scared of some king and some ruthless king and some, you know, corrupt king. Shimon walks with God. Shimon obviously is a holy man. By the way, you see it in the story that Shimon's a holy man because Shimon has the power to invoke God. What did Shimon say? I'm adding a little bit now and interpreting. Shimon said, I'm not speaking on behalf of myself. I'm speaking on behalf of God. 
And you see Shimon speaking on behalf of God, right? Because Shimon actually can invite God into the court. When Shimon speaks, God doesn't ignore him, right? God sends Gabriel a, the angel. Rabbi, you need to adjust your camera. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Better. Yeah. Shimon has the capacity to summon. I'm just saying there's something very confusing here. On the one hand, Shimon seems to be heroic, righteous, gutsy, holy. And I'm even adding, he, he somehow has the power. He's such a, a righteous sage that he could summon God and Gabriel into the courtroom. And yet, and yet, Alan points out that at the very end, the conclusion is that Shimon, we don't go with Shimon. The very conclusion is that don't judge a king who's ruthless, right? Don't go, don't, don't bring Janaeus into court. Don't uh, try to uh, test the guts of your fellow sages, don't, leave, leave him alone, don't judge him. So in a way, B5 seems to pull the rug out from the under the whole story. Doesn't B5 undermine Shimon? Doesn't B5 say Janaeus was in a way right not to show up? Or at least the colleagues of Shimon are right not to judge him? Because B5, the conclusion says, don't judge a king who's ruthless. What, what, do you get, where, where, where do you get the who's ruthless? I'm adding. Well, he definitely is. Adding okay. I'm adding. Well, I'm adding from two things. First of all, other stories. But but also, even in this story, it's very clear in this story that he doesn't want to show up. He tries to send his slave. He comes and sits down. He tells Shimon, uh, you know, I'm not going to go by you. And, and by the way, God it seems to be through Gabriel, very angry and disappointed at the colleagues of Shimon, so much so that they deserve the death penalty. Yeah. Right? Do um, they deserve the death penalty for that? I'm just curious. It well, seems like a very did, harsh uh, decision. <laughs> I hear your question, Joe, but in a way that it sounds from the story like they do. I mean, Gabriel, they're they're dead. Gabriel, why, why, Gabriel yeah. kills them. So I don't know. We assume God sends Gabriel for good reasons. I don't know. Why does Gabriel kill them? I mean, I think it's a very harsh sentence. It's very know. harsh. It is very harsh. I mean, believe me, I'm, I'm a tough guy, but this is kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Hey, we're not going to judge you. against you either. No, I hear you. <laughs> so, so do people have other thoughts? Like, I, 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 Alan's question's good. Joe's question's good. Like, it's a very, it's very intense. It's a hey, very high standard. It? I didn't hear what Alan said. What did Alan say? Yeah, then it was stated. Uh, who stated it? There's yeah, that's a good question some, too. There's something missing between B4 and B5. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Then it was stated. So who's the it? In the Hebrew, it's Boto Sha'a Amru. It's equally ambiguous. At that moment, they said, who's the day? So I mean I would I guess I'd fill in the blanks and say the sages, which the sages. sages. I don't think Shimon, <laughs> I don't think Shimon said it, but I guess the sages who weren't in the court that day. Or the ghosts of the sages that uh, perished. So, so do you think that Shimon was happy with his decision? Yeah, I don't know. I don't happy? see how Shimon was happy. It seems to be uh I mean they, they still were silver colleagues, you know. Yeah, it seems to be a uh, disappointing. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. The, the whole thing is, seems to be very, very, uh, I don't know. The whole story builds up Shimon and then uh, like drops him. In a way. Think about it. We, uh, most people in our lives, we have incident, incidents like this when colleagues or friends disappoint you, but you're not wishing them death or try to kill them, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, but, but Shimon... I don't think Shimon's getting even with his colleagues. Shimon thinks that his colleagues have committed. Let me just emphasize one point. I, I, this is an interpretation, so you don't need to agree, but I'll interpret for a minute. Uh, allow me at least to suggest something. Who's on trial? And I would argue that in the legend, the answer of who's on trial changes. Initially, the king is on trial. The king is on trial. 
But by the time you get to B4, it's actually the cowardly sages who are on trial. The, 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 the trial has changed. It began with a king being on trial for his slave's murder. But by the time we get to B4, there's other people who are on trial and that's cowardly sages. And so who's the judge? God. In the beginning, it's sages being the messenger for God's justice. By the time you get to B4, it's God judging through an angel. And who's on trial? Cowardly judges. So in other words, that's part of, I think, the, the rich tapestry almost of this legend. That's why it's, it, was this a historical event? Maybe, but there's also, I think, a certain moral here. But the problem I struggle with is Alan's uh, still, what, what is the moral exactly? What is the moral? Now, See, I want to- I get a different picture here. Yeah. So Wonderful. like, are you allowed to lie if your life is at risk? Okay. I say yes. So, so, so go continue. So if this guy was a ruthless king. Yeah. These guys feared for their life. Yeah. So either way, they were going to die. Yeah. If they tried him. Yeah. And convicted him. Yeah. They were going to die. So it's just yeah. a question of who kills them. Does yeah. Hashem kill them or does the king kill them? Yeah. So actually, maybe the issue is with this Simeon person. Yeah. Shimon. 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 Shimon sometimes maybe i mean isn't there another example where uh shimon ben Jetta. well but there's shimon bar yochai also oh. when he came out of the cave yeah got upset at what people were doing yeah people died and hashem sent him back in the cave for a year yeah so these oh. sadikim can like when they get upset at somebody, they They're can dangerous. mess it up, but maybe They're dangerous. <laughs> yeah, maybe get Hashem in, get is in, saying, get in, get in. maybe they're saying, Look, get in. Get none in. of this was good. Yeah, no, I, I, Phil, I think that's actually very helpful. Phil, Phil, I think you're explaining a little bit how we get from the story through B4 and then B5. And you're well, saying, I... you're saying, just one second, and I don't want to hear the comment. Phil's saying, Maybe I'm adding a little bit, but I think this is the thrust of what you're saying. The thrust of what you're saying is, Shimon, you might be right, but you're operating like <laughs> in some plane of tzaddikim that is like not really sustainable by most people. And therefore, you're all disappointed and you're angry and a righteous person's, you know, these, these are like the great righteous people in rabbinic tradition and they have powers. So God's not just going to ignore their like anger, like because they're right on some level, they're right. But on another level, like it's too much to ask. It's too much to ask. Like these sages, like you could view them as like disappointments, failures, cowards. And I hear, still hear Joe's question like, OK, but you should die for being a coward. So you're a coward, like you're not a corrupt, terrible but that's person. not the point of this whole okay, thing. It's so a, what do you think? It, can I say something? Yes. Go well, ahead. this is not the the whole point that you're giving us is to justify or somehow show how the Babylonian Talmud justified the distinction between Davidic kings and non-Davidic kings. Okay. And then it goes off on a crazy tangent, like the worst extreme that could happen to okay. justify it. Okay. Okay. So seems disingenuous to use this as an example as to why this no good Nick king who really should be checked more than the davidic king and should be judged more than the davidic king because he's corrupt somehow gets off because they shift the narrative to the sages and some lofty you know sonic who went a little off yeah. i mean it's like so i'm sorry it's so drastic when in reality i think the moral of the story is the davidic kings would never fall to the stoop to the level of this king. And so there wouldn't be this catastrophe of judgment. 
And there, I, everything I think that's is, the point of it. One sec, everything you say is good. And therefore, what? So, what should. The, I, I think the, the conclusion is they, they, it's almost like they dredge up this, this story of calamity to show the dangers of even messing around with bad kings, whereas the Davidic kings are, neat, are known to be sodic and pure. So, you'll never have this drastic oh, situation. Okay, with good. And, and, wait one kings second. There, one sec, one sec. Alan, just give me one second. And therefore, you should judge Davidic kings and, and not. Judge and therefore, you won't get into this ludicrous situation with the Vidic kings who can be judged so, and so therefore you can judge them right because they're never going to fall into this crazy situation with a slave who falls which causes everybody to quiver in front of the king so that they die okay I, everything you say but, is good I'm not sure the, but I you're what acting. about David David had had the soldier killed so he could marry his wife right and he wasn't exactly well. He was judged by uh, God and the prophet. That, well, what, uh, well, who was Jezebel's husband? Achav. And he wasn't exactly a, uh, a, a saint. Yeah, a, a sterling member yeah. of the uh, of the kingly class. Yeah. That, I, no, I, I again, like I said at the beginning, I, I the judge part, I, I can go either way. But be judged. Yeah. I don't see why there should be an exemption for either. Uh, Davidic or non-Davidic. Okay. Well, you know what? I'm making yeah. a certain no, assumption in my head right now. I'm thinking about something completely different that has to do with present-day Jewish issues. Yeah. If you think about the influence that some ultra-right rabbis have on their students or their you know members, and sometimes they brainwash them. Yeah. And these young people don't understand what they're doing, and they're creating or doing horrible things. Okay. Like like the young man that killed uh, Rabin. Okay. You know, so I think these rap uh, these great geniuses were supposed to be leaders of their religion. It's a bit too much. They have to be a little bit more sure, measured. Joe, I hear the modern critique, but uh, are you relating this to the story somehow or not? Yeah, I'm trying to. And uh, what's the relationship? You're saying Shimon is the radical rabbi? I think so. Yeah. But I don't know. The story is very sympathetic to Shimon. I mean, God, God seems to be on Shimon's side. Yeah, but the minute, I, I, the, minute the, uh, the disciple is a uh, man were killed, yeah. he's no longer an innocent, in my opinion. I hear you, but he didn't kill them. God killed them. But maybe, I mean, I hear Phil's point that maybe God can ignore him, but I don't think you could see him as a radical who's like, uh, listen, I have no problems personally saying that there's some rabbis today who are very problematic. I don't think you could say that about Shimon in the eyes of the rabbis. Now, can I, I make think, Yeah, thing? yeah, my father wants to add something, please. I think what's going on here. You know, everything follows except for sentence five. One sec, Alan, Alan, one sec. Yeah, go ahead. Can I make a sentence? Yes, yes, go ahead. I think what's going on here, here are these judges and there's this guy, and what they and they really think that he's guilty. Yeah, they don't. They're afraid of him because he's right. a hoodlum. Right. So therefore, they keep their mouth shut and they don't talk when they right. should be talking. Right. And with the an Israeli with a Jewish king, they don't have that kind of a fear that he's really a hoodlum. No, but Janaeus uh, Alexander Yanai is a hoodlum. Yeah, yeah, and that's why they're afraid really to judge him. Okay, but he's Jewish. Why do you say not? Oh, a, a, a Davidic king. A Davidic king, right. Davidic king no, is that's right. More, more of a decent guy. He would accept the judgment. I, I, I everything you're dealing with a hoodlum. That, that's a right. Hoodlum. The question is, this is the question. I just want to summarize where we're at. We're almost out of time. I just want to summarize. I still feel like Alan asked a strong question that maybe some people here feel like you have a satisfactory answer to it. But to me, it's not. It's still, we... Yeah, maybe, maybe we started to articulate, but I just want to make sure everybody hears Alan's question. I'm going to just uh, summarize it. Uh, let, let me just speak where you have to wrap up. I'll just tell us where we're at. The Mishnah says you do not judge a king. The Babylonian Talmud says, actually, that's uh, not a complete uh, statement. It depends on the king. Non-Davidic kings, you do not judge. Davidic kings, you judge.
what's the difference? Why non-Davidic kings, you don't judge? Like sort of counterintuitive. You would think non-Davidic kings are less good kings, so you should judge them. And Davidic kings are better, you should not judge. It seems like backwards. So the Talmud says, you know what? It all relates back to a story. And I even take the comment which I thought was an interesting comment that this story is a bit of an extreme story, but that's true. Even an extreme story, it seems to uh, concern the rabbis enough that the Mishnah legislates and the legislation is non-Davidic kings might be hulum, so therefore let's not judge them. Okay, and everybody that so far we understand, except when we go through the story, the story actually seems to be moving in the direction that you should judge a hoodlum. Mm -hmm. Shimon, who's a heroic sage, and I am adding, but we know Shimon from elsewhere in rabbinic stories, including in the beginning of Pirkei Avos. Shimon is a standout sage. And Shimon says, let's be bold and judge this hoodlum king. And Shimon seems to understand that that is not a matter of a power play, it's doing God's work. And that's what it means to be a judge in the ideal halacha, it's to do God's work. And God's law applies to everybody, certainly to a hoodlum king, just one second. And therefore he has the guts to look at the hoodlum king in the eye and his colleagues are more cowardly. And their cowardness, I would argue, is problematic. And the proof that it's problematic is that Gabriel strikes them down. So, and nevertheless, at the end of the day, the enactment is don't judge a hoodlum king. So Alan asks, why shouldn't the enactment be judge a hoodlum king? Why should the enactment be not judge a hoodlum king? And the, the answer I heard that maybe there are a bunch of answers, but the answer that I hear a little bit was from what Phil was saying. That Phil was saying that even as Shimon is right on some level, Shimon is this tzaddik with sort of these powers, but but at the end of the day, the colleagues, they, they're, they're punished <coughs> through the wrath of Shimon because he's a righteous tzaddik. But at the end of the day, the colleagues, even if they're disappointing, disappointing doesn't mean deserving of death. And that's Joe's point. Maybe they're lame. Maybe they're weak. Maybe they're cravenly, but they should die. Like th there's something that w w spiraled out of control here. So then we make an enactment. That That's sort of where I, I hear. Anybody want to make last comments? Next yeah, I, I don't. I think the last sentence is wrong. Just think about it. If you were over there. And Shimon is saying this, that he's looking at these guys and these guys are looking at the ground. And all of a sudden you get lightning from the sky, striking these guys dead. Well, how do you think the king is going to react? How do you think the other people in the audience are going to react? Do you think they're going to say, oh, the king shouldn't be judged or uh, shouldn't judge? No, they're going to say, sure, uh, sure, he has to be judged because God just proved it. Alan, I am very sympathetic to your comment. And next week, I'm going to bring a source to support your comment. <laughs> Bill. So what I was thinking is this is a corrupt time. Yeah. And one of the corruptions was that the Kohen Gadol was also the political power, right? Yeah. Now, isn't it the Kohen Gadol who's supposed to anoint the king? Okay. Here, the no. Kohen Gadol himself is the king. Okay, so right. maybe this is a warning that if you're going to be in the Sanhedrin and you're going to let this happen, you're going to wind up with kings who could do whatever they want. And that's, that's sort of the warning that you know this. So before you're going to let a corrupt king rise, right. if you're on the Sanhedrin, the problem is you're you're not going to ever be able to get justice with that because of this law. And maybe that's an incentive for the, the point of the law is sort of to tell you, look, this is what it's it's inferior. Don't even go down this path. Make yeah. sure you find the Vita Kings. Yeah, because then you have a supreme ruler with no check and balance yeah. in this yeah. case. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rabbi, can you try to bring us some uh, examples next week? that we can apply to what's happening today and see if we can apply to some situation. You know, but no, I, I think the best example, I'm sorry to get political here, but the best example is 
according to the Talmud, assuming for a second that Donald Trump did things that are problematic, should we turn yeah. the other way or we should we I her use earlier. all our energy to Let's apply it to, to what happens with the Jewish people in a country like Israel. And, and, and Bibi Netanyahu. Same right, exact that's thing. right. This makes more sense to me than Trump. I don't care about no, but Trump. Doesn't make it, but Joe, I hear you, but it doesn't make a difference. So take Bibi. Let's assume for a second, put our Likud or anti-Likud hats on the side. Let's assume Bibi did something that is illegal. The question is, should the country of Israel be spending all this time and energy to try to go after him? Or should they look the other way because the price is too high? I think this Talmudic story relates to that issue. I'm not saying right, that's a black I like and white that. stand, but yeah, it relates to it. Yeah, my father, and then let's stop for tonight. Yeah, my mama. father. What yeah. I find puzzling in all of this, that because they're cowards, really, of the hoodlum, that's why they should be struck dead. Right, right. So that's Joe's question also. It is a tough question. And that's what Phil tried to answer a little bit, that. but it is a tough question. Okay, there's more to say, and there's one or two really interesting sources that relate that I'll bring next time. So I look forward to next week. Shavuato. Shavuato, thank you. Oh.